Hello friends. Today we are going to talk about Teridophyta. I am Dr. Vineet Vaidya from Department of Botany, Thakur College of Science and Commerce, Kandivli. So we are going to talk about Teridophytes, its general characters as well as classification. Now when we are talking about Teridophyta, this is the common approach that we are talking about that this is made up of two particular words called as teris and phyta where the teris means the feather like plants and phyta means the plants so we are going to get the plants which are giving the appearance like the feather and that is what the teridophyta is all about now in this particular presentation we are going to face certain kind of characters as well as the classification of teridophyta so we are going to focus on the given introduction. So when we are talking about teridophytes, we are going to give first of all that what exactly it means. The term teridophytes is derived from a Greek word tyron means a feather and phyton means a plant. And that is how the word teridophyta has been derived. Therefore, teridophytes is a group of the plants with feather-like appearance. It is not compulsory that it is all the time feather-like appearance for all the plants. But in general, when we are talking about 90% of the plants which belong to this particular group, they are going to give you the appearance like that. And that is why the name has been given. There is a long history for this particular group of the plants right from the beginning of this particular planet. And we are going to have the significance of these particular plants that how these plants have developed, what are their characteristic features and how they have been classified by various kinds of people so that we are in a position to study them. So this group includes higher cryptogams which are also known as vascular cryptogams. The term cryptogams is being composed of two latin words that is cryptos hidden and gamos that is wedded which was suggested by carl linnaeus in 1754 long back in 18th century for all the non-flowering plants that reproduce by means of spores and do not produce the seeds so these are basically the vascular cryptogams because these are the plants which are not producing the seeds but they are having the vasculature which is present in them now when we talk about the vasculature, what is vasculature? Vasculature is nothing but the presence of xylem and phloem in the plant which is been meant for conduction of water as well as the food material which is not been seen in the previous group. Because when we are going to talk about the plants, we are talking about algae, fungi, bryophyta, pteridophyta, gymnosperms and angiosperms. Now when we are talking about pteridophytes, these are the plants which have been placed in between bryophyta and gymnosperms. In bryophyta, we are going to see that there is a development of the conducting strand but which is not differentiated into xylem and phloem. And as we are going ahead from the pteridophytes, that is in gymnosperms, we can see there is a well mechanism which has been developed for conduction of water as well as the food material. So this is the group which we are dealing with where we are having the combined characters of bryophytes and gymnosperms and these are going to give you some unique features. So that is why this group becomes very very important to study and it is one of the main connecting link in the evolutionary trends. So the term vascular indicates the presence of vascular tissue as I have already told you, xylem and phloem for conduction of the water and food respectively. Because before this, whatever plants were present, they were showing the hierarchy where the plants have not been categorized with the presence of vasculature. So there was absence of xylem and phloem. So this is the first group of plants amongst the entire plant kingdom, which is going to give you the development of the vasculature, which we are going to talk about. So thus the vascular cryptogams or pteridophytes can be defined as an assemblage of the seedless vascular plants that have successfully invaded the land and reproduced by means of spores. These are very important characters of pteridophytes where we are talking about the first plants which are going to be there as the land plants as well as they are going to reproduce by means of the spores. That does not mean that the vegetative reproduction and sexual reproduction is not taking place in the plant. But the main focus is been given on the spores. The plant itself is a sporophyte that is the diploid body 
which is going to produce the spore producing organs in terms of sorus or sporangia in which the spores are present. The spores will be dispersed by certain kind of mechanism and these spores when they spread out to the favorable conditions, these are going to germinate and they are going to give rise to the required plant. So, if we continue furthermore, we are going to talk about this particular term was first coined by Haeckel. Eichler in 1883 divided this plant kingdom into cryptogamia and phanerogamia. That is the cryptogams and phanerogams what we know today. The cryptogamia was further divided into thallophyta, bryophyta and teratophyta. Engler in 1909 included the bryophyta and teratophyta under embryophyta. So, there are various kind of people who have worked on this particular mechanism. They have understood these particular evolutionary trends. They have studied various kinds of genera, various kind of species and according to their understanding, they have developed this kind of a mechanism and given the classification system. In case of pteridophytes, we usually follow the uh, GM Smith classification which we are going to talk a little later. So, here we are going to concentrate furthermore on the characters. So, due to discovery of the fossil plants, the classification of pteridophytes has undergone a vast change in recent past. Older taxonomies divided the vascular plants into two divisions, pteridophyta, primitive vascular plants and spermatophyta, presence of the seeds. Now, this particular discovery was dependent upon various kinds of fossil records and as well as the kind of the plants which are existing today in the present scenario. So, they were very clear that there are two group of plants. There are going to be the primitive vascular plant with absence of seeds and there are going to be the highly advanced plants with presence of seeds and that is how pteridophyta and spermatophyta have been divided. But there was something which was new. What was that? However, the dis distinction became invalid due to discovery of seed-bearing fossil plants, that is cycadophilicals. Now, when we are talking about cycadophyta, that is the group of the gymnosperms, and filicals is one of the orders which is there in pteridophyta. So, this was the combination of two different groups of the plants, that is pteridophytes and gymnosperms, and such kind of plants were existing on this planet. So, when we are talking about such kind of a plants, then there is a possibility that there are going to be the period of amalgamation on in evolution of these particular plants. So, based upon this, Sinet in 1935 introduced a new term tracheophyta for the division which possess the sporophyte with well-developed vascular tissue. So, People were thinking that this kind of a thing, plants were existing, this kind of plants are existing and these plants are having the severe distinction between them. But later on, when we develop certain kind of fossil records, at that time we came to know that there is amalgamation of the characters and we have to conclude that there is a development of various kinds of plants at various levels in the given time span or the time era. And that is what we are here to focus upon that why pteridophytes are so important. When we are talking about pteridophytes, many of the times we are just taking them as the plants which are there for the decoration. But my dear students try to understand that this is a connecting link between various kinds of other plants and if we are going to study them, that can give you the further more in, uh, information where we are going to talk about various other characters. So, here I am presenting to all of you the general life cycle of pteridophytes. Now, when I am talking about general life cycle of pteridophytes, how it should go? So, let us start from sporophyte which is the plant body. The plant body is divided into true roots, leaves and stem. It is the diploid plant body which is going to give you the development of microsporophyll, megasporophyll. Microsporophyll is deployed in nature, megasporophyll is also deployed in nature. Microsporophyll as all of us we know, it is going to produce the microsporangium and megasporophyll is going to produce the megasporangium. The microsporangia and megasporangia will undergo process of meiosis. Now here I would like to draw your attention that this is the changing phase in the life cycle. When we are talking about meiosis, it is a reduction division where 
a diploid cell is going to divide and going to give rise to the four haploid cells and that is how microsporangia to microspores and megasporangia to megaspores respectively have given rise to. So, in this case, if you are going to look at the diagram, microspore and megaspore are the haploid cells. The microspore will germinate to give rise to the male gametophyte. The megaspore is going to germinate to give rise to the female gametophyte. Male gametophyte is going to give rise to the anthridium. Female gametophyte is going to give rise to the archegonium. Now, here again, we have to see whether these particular anthridia and archegonia are together. Then that is called as monoecious thallus or it is also called as bisexual. If they are going to be separated on two different thalli, then that is the dioecious thallus or the thallus is going to be unisexual. That is, one particular thallus is going to show you the anthridia, one particular thallus is going to show you the archegonia. But obviously, the anthridium is going to produce the anthrozoids and archegonium is going to produce the egg cell. When anthrozoids and egg cells have been formed, again there is a common characteristic feature which is going to connect pteridophytes with the bryophyta that they require water for the process of fertilization. The anthrozoids are moving with the swirling movement of the flagella and they are going to find out where the archegonium is located. Now, how they are going to locate this? This procedure is called as chemotaxis. Now, when we are talking about chemotaxis, this particular process is going to give you the liberation of the chemicals in the form of certain acids, which is generally the malic acid. This particular malic acid is been sprayed around the mature archegonium, which is been sensed by the anthrozoids and anthrozoids will try to move to that particular region. Where all the anthrozoids will try to enter, only one anthrozoid will be successful to enter the mature archegonium and this mature archegonium will be consisting of the mature egg cell. When anthrozoid is going to reach the egg cell, it is going to fertilize it and finally we are going to get a fertilized product that is called as zygote which is going to be deployed in nature. Now, this is the first, uh, you know, group of the plants where zygote is developing into an embryo and it is going to show you a well-established diploid embryo, which is going to show you various kinds of parts and its existence. This embryo sooner or later will undergo the process of germination to give rise to the young sporophyte and finally we are going to get the development of the mature diploid sporophyte that is the plant body of pteridophyte. So here this particular cycle will continue and this cycle is going to keep the plant and the stages alive. This is called as alternation of generation or in nutshell this can be called as the process of life cycle of pteridophytes. I am not going to say that the process is going to be the same in each and every pteridophyte but definitely I can say you that this particular process is going to be similar and that is why we are discussing the general process. If you are going to talk about any kind of pteridophyte you are going to see that this particular life cycle is going to get continued. And that is why this part is very important to understand when we are talking about general characters of pteridophytes. So, let us move further and understand what is the classification of the pteridophytes. Because classification of the pteridophyta is dependent upon the various characters. Once we are aware of the characters that okay, there is going to be a plant body, that plant body is going to be deployed, that plant body is going to be a sporophyte which is going to give rise to the spores. This spores will germinate to give rise to a prothallus or a gametophyte. Gametophyte is going to give rise to the male and the re female reproductive organs in the form of anthridia and archegonia. And finally, you are going to get development of the zygote. Zygote will germinate to give rise to a new plant again. Once we are aware of these kind of characters, then we are in a position to categorize these plants according to their hierarchical levels and according to their characters. And then we are going to get this particular classification. So, let's have a look. So, modern botanists such as Smith, 1955, 
Bold in 1957, Benson in 1957 again, Zimmerman in 1959, Cronquist in 1960, and Takhtajan in 1964 have dropped the term tracheophyta as a taxon, raising the different groups of the lower vascular plant themselves to the division level. Smith 1955 divided the vascular cryptogams into four divisions. Students, when we are talking about either first year level, second year level, or third year level, we are following G M Smith classification, which has been given in 1955. So it is very very essential and important for the students of undergraduate level from the University of Mumbai to understand that we have to get categorize pteridophytes into only four groups. based upon this there can be any kind of a modern technology or any kind of a modern system which can be developed but when we are talking about bentham and hooker system for the classification of the angiosperms we try to focus with its merit and demerits the similar kind of a approach is required that we should classify the given pteridophytes by smith's classification which was been given in 1955 so here we are going to see the hierarchy it is going to get divided into the four divisions that is xylophyta lepidophyta calamophyta and pterophyta so xylophyta is the group of the lower pteridophytes which are very few who are going to show their presence on this planet today most of them are the fossil records lepidophyta is also called as lycophyta Calamophyta is further more development where it is also called as phenophyta and pterophyta is one of the group of the highly evolved pteridophytes amongst all please draw your attention to two different terminologies over here pteridophytes pterophytes so these are two different terminologies pteridophyta is a complete group of the plants while pterophyta is one of the divisions of the pteridophyta so xylophyta can be further classified into class xylophytini lepidophyta is further divided into class lycopodini calamophyta includes class equisitini and pterophyta includes the class filicini and under that again we are going to have various kinds of subclasses which can be at the level of xylophytes and xylotales xylophytes when we are talking about these are all the fossil records xylotales what we are talking about xylotum is the only living genus which is going to give you the idea about that xylophytes i think all of us we are aware of rhinia what we have studied under lycopodini we have lycopodials which lycophyta we are studying at ty level selaginellales which selaginella you have studied at sy level lepidodendrons lepidodendron is the fossil record what you have observed and isoites is including isoites as one of the living genus when we are talking about calamophyta and class equisitini we are having hyneals sphenophyllales and equisetales if we are going to talk about equisetales especially in ty we have life cycle of equisetum which is the hostel fern and that is going to be included under calamophyta when we are talking about pterophyta we are having filicini under which we are having two subclasses that is primophylicase and subclass eusporangiate subclass the leptosporangiate so there are going to be one subclass which is going to be very primary and remaining two subclasses what are going to be are eusporangiate and leptosporangiate now here i would like to draw your attention that what is eu and leptosporangiate when we are talking about eu that is the true sporangiate means sporangium formation true sporangium formation leptos means a group of the cells sporangiate is against sporangium so if we are going to segregate them on the basis of the sporangium formation eusporangiate is the subclass where you are going to get the development of the sporangium only from one cell and if we are going to talk about the next subclass that is leptosporangiate where you are going to get development of the sporangium from the group of the cells so this is what is the characteristic feature we need to come focus upon okay let's move further we are going to see that how this particular chart is been depicted in a pictorial form so definitely there is uh, you know you can see that this particular diagram has been taken from plant science for you and the reference is also been mentioned so this is a classification given by smith bold and zimmerman 
respectively in 1955, 57 and 59. Based upon this, there can be various kind of other things which can be developed and there are certain modifications dependent upon the various kind of characters which have been studied later on and there is a modern classification system. But as for the undergraduate level of University of Mumbai and Thakur College as autonomous college, we are focusing on GMs with classification. So I am recording all these things for all of you. So if I'm talking about Silophyta, I'm going to get the characters like the plants are most primitive. These are the rootlet plants with the rhizoids. There is a dichotomous branching. There is a photosynthetic stem because the leaves are very much reduced and the stem is going to help in photosynthesis. The leaves are often absent and that is why the plant has to take up somewhere the activity of photosynthesis which has been taken up by the stem. There is presence of a protostele which is a very very primitive type of the stele. The synangium is going to be homosporous. Synangium is the aggregation of the sporangia which is going to be present as a reproductive body which is asexual reproductive structure and they are going to be showing presence of similar kind of spores that's why homosporous. So if we are going to look at this particular group the fossil genera are Rhinia and Horniophyton, which we have already seen in the uh, fossil records and the uh, living genera is Silotum along with Timesperis. So that particular thing is only living genera which are left out on this planet from Silophyta. So hey friends, there is a utmost need that we should be focusing on this group of plants whereby they need to be preserved otherwise they are also going to be fossil records. Second when we are focusing on lycophyta they are the club mosses or the spike mosses. Now if they are going to concentrate on the characters they are differentiated plant bodies. The leaves are going to be microphylous. Now what do you mean by microphylous leaf? If you are going to look at the primitive leaf, it is not going to show you any kind of venlet or midrib present. But if you are going to see the uh, slightly developed leaf, you are going to see that there is going to be a single midrib present in between. Okay, there may be differentiation of the venlets or may not be there. But only one single midrib has been developed that is called as microphylous leaf. So the protostele sometimes is a siphonostele, protostele which is the primitive stele which is present, siphonostele if we are talking about siphon they are going to be the you know tunnel like structures which have been formed in between. So they are going to be present, sporophylls are aggregated to form the strobilus as well as the cones. The condition is going to be homosporous as it has been uh, you know denoted. It is in Selaginella or Lycopodium or it can be also heterosporous. So here we are going to see development of different kind of spores as well. Gametophyte is dependent on the fungus for the food. So there is an invasion of the other kind of a plant that is a fungus into the development. So this particular part is very much specialized and confined to the group Lycophyta. Now third when we are talking about Phenophyta that is generally called as hostile plants. All are the fossil except Equisetum. Equisetum is the only plant which is going to be representing this particular group. The plant body is completely differentiated. Stem is having a jointed appearance where you are going to see the development of the nodes and internodes. Scaly leaves have been seen whirled around the node. So you are going to see the scaly leaves which are going to be present around the nodal region. Sporangia forming the strobili cones that is one of the characteristic features of all the pteridophytes and usually when we are going to talk about the spores the condition is going to be homosporous. Now friends we are moving to the fourth highly evolved uh, group that is pterophyta. They are also called as ferns or felicophyta. So as the characters are depicted most widely distributed vascular cryptogams. The plant body is differentiated uh, into the stems, rhizome, leaves, rachis, various kinds of parts so that they are slowly and steadily getting modified and slowly and steadily they are developing their characters. The young leaves show sarcinate venation, spirally coiled that is also called as sarcinate tixis. Sarcinate means spirally coiled and tixis means the arrangement of the leaf. Here now if we are going to look at the stele, stele can be of different types. It can be a protostele, it can be a siphonostele, it can be a dextiostele. Now friends here I would like to draw your attention that what is a protostele, what is a siphonostele, what is a dictiostele. 
Now, protostele is a primitive stele. I think all of us, we are aware that we have studied about haplostele, uh, actinostele, plectostele and mixed stele, which are the protostele. Siphonostele can be of two different types. That is going to be ectofloic and amphiploic. And dictyostele is a part of solenostele where the stelar region is broken down into the vasculature because of presence of the leaf traces or leaf gaps. So here actually we get into solenostele, dictyostele, then eustele, atactostele. But here up to dictyostele, we are in a position to see all the types in pteridophytes. We are going to see eustele, which is typically present in a typical dicot stem. And we are going to see presence of atactostele typically in a monocot stem. So sporangias form the sori on the abaxial side of the leaf. So this is what is a characteristic feature. So the sorus is been developed in a peculiar structure which has been highly protected under the leaf. The leaf is going to do the function of photosynthesis and below that we are going to see the presence of the sorus. The sporocarp is a specialized structure which has been developed into marsilia. So if we are going to talk about all the pteridophytes what we are studying, in FYBSC you have all studied about nephrolipis, in SY you have studied about selaginella, now in TY we are talking about the four life cycles that is going to be lycopodium, equisitum, adiantum and marsilia. So if we are talking about marsilia, it is a highly evolved structure from marsilials where we are going to see the sporocarp inside which the spores have been formed. The indusium may be true or false. True indusium and false indusium can be present in various kinds of plants. There can be homosporous condition as we are going to see in teres and heterosporous condition as we are going to see in marsilia and anthrozoids are going to be multi-flagellated. Usually there can be presence of two flagella but over here there is a development for the faster movement and for faster sensation there is going to be development of multi flagellate structure. So, I hope that all of you are understanding this classification given by Smith, which is a very, very simple and unique kind of a classification. Today, we are talking about the modern system of classification, which we need to apply and which we need to take into cognizance. But according to me, whatever classification Smith has given is very easy to understand and identify the plants on the field. And that is why many of the countries, including India, even today, we are trying to follow GM Smith classification. So moving further, we are going to talk about the various systematic positions of various genera. Now here, we, as we have discussed already, that we have already studied Nephrolipis, which is a part of the Terophyta. You have already studied Selaginella in SY, which is a part of the second year syllabus. And this year, that is in third year, we are studying about the various four cycles. So I am trying to give you the compare and contrast of these four cycles, what we are studying over here. So let's have a look at these particular categories. So there are four categories I have considered. We are considering the various kinds of divisions, class, subclass, order, family and genus. Now, order is not the terminology generally what we are using in botany. Right now, we are using the word cohort. But in the original classification, this particular order word has been used. So I have just kept it like that. So if I'm going to talk about four different plants as Lycopodium, Equisitum, Adiantum and Marsilia as the representative example from the four groups, they respectively belong to either Lycophyta or Lepidophyta that is Lycopodium, Calamophyta or Spinophyta that is Equisitum, Terophyta, Adiantum, Terophyta, Marsilia. So there are two examples from Terophyta. Now, if I'm going to concentrate on the classes, that is going to be Lycopodini, Equisitini, Felicini and Felicini again. Now, if we are going to talk about Lycophyta and Calamophyta, there are no subclasses. But in case of Terophyta, there are two subclasses as we have previously discussed. One is Leptosporangiety and one is Eusporangiety. So, over here, both the examples are from Leptosporangiety. Then there are orders. So, order of Lycopodium is Lycopodials. Order of Equisitum is Equisitals, Order of Adiantum is Polypodials and Order of Marsilia is Marsilials. And then further they have been classified on the basis of the family that is Lycopodiaceae, Equisitini, Teridaceae and Marsiliaceae respectively. So these are the comparative study of various kinds of genera what we are talking about. 
so it is lycopodium equisetum adiantum and marsilia i have purposely not included nephrolipis in this because that is the plant which has been cultivated and if we are going to talk about even selaginella there are definitely the wild species so we are talking about the plants which are naturally occurring which are the wild species where the gm space has given the consideration about it so we are talking about the entire characteristic features as well as the classification system of the pteridophyta so if we are going to work out with the references because it is very much required that which kind of references you are referring this is the most important slide according to me because whenever i'm doing the presentation or whenever i'm doing certain kind of study there can be lot many references which can be utilized and this is the most important thing that we have to acknowledge those particular people or those particular authors from where we have taken the material because i am not creating this material on my own so the references i would like to talk about is first one is the textbook of pteridophyta br vashishta for undergraduate students this is one of the most lucid language and this can be understood by anybody and everybody pteridophyta by op sharma again a very nice book to refer so i have referred that i have given you the information from that Pteridophyta by Rashid. This is a little bit technical book. If you want to know about various kinds of technicalities and technical terms, then you need to refer to this book. There is a main book which we are talking about is a Cryptogamic Botany Volume Two by Jim Smith because we are following Jim Smith classification. So we need to follow this particular book and that has got various references and various life cycles to be studied. Also, this particular uh, you know diagrams and photographs have been taken. So that is from pteridophytes characteristic features and classification, which I have picked up from the URL. And this is also the classification which we have seen the pictorial guide about the classification and its uh, you know various kinds of collections. So this has been picked up from the classification of pteridophytes by Smith, nineteen fifty five, Bold, nineteen fifty seven, and Zimmerman, nineteen fifty nine. So that is the plant sciences for you dot com. So these are the references what been used, and I hope that every one of you is understanding that what exactly are the classification system we are following, why it is important that we should focus on GM Smith classification which was originally given, how this GM Smith classification is dependent upon the various kinds of characters what we are studying, and. how the group of pteridophytes is very very important to study as the link between the hierarchical development of various groups of plants if we are going to talk about the plant kingdom where we are talking about algae fungi bryophytes pteridophytes gymnosperms and angiosperms so among these all six groups this is going to be a major link which are going to be kind of first terrestrial plants which are the vascular cryptogams so they are showing you the presence of the vasculature for the first time that is xylem and phloem which has been produced for conduction of water and food material these are the plants which are non seed bearing these are the plants which are going to establish as the terrestrial plants for the first time but yet they require water for completion of their uh, reproductive structures as well as the reproductive process that is a process of fertilization so my dear friends these are very important group of plants what we are talking about so i'll request all of you that we should focus on these particular plants and we are going to work out these plants there can be n number of questions which are still unanswered because there is a lacuna there is a gap there is lack of the various kinds of fossil records of these plants which still we are looking forward to still we can change this classification still we can study the further characters and we can use various kinds of modern equipments for study of these particular things so thank you so much this is all from my side i am dr vinith vaidya from department of botany thakur college of science and commerce thank you so much